My name is Tanya and I was born and raised in England. During my adolescent years, I became an Islamist. With my husband, we were trying to establish a caliphate. We moved around the world, found ourselves in Egypt and then Syria during the war. By this time, I was an agnostic. I decided to leave with my children because I didn't want to be a Muslim. We moved to America and I embraced American values. And now I'm learning about the Bible for the first time. So, John 1, chapter 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to bear witness about the light that all might believe through him. He was not the light, but he came to bear witness about the light. The true light, which gives light to everyone, was coming into the world. He was in the world, and the world was made through him, yet the world did not know him. He came to his own, and his own people did not receive him. But to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God, who were born not of blood, not of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen his glory, glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. John bore witness about him and cried out, This was he of whom I said, He comes, he who comes after me ranks before me, because he was before me. For from his fullness we have all received grace upon grace. For the law was given through Moses, grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. No one has ever seen God, the only God who is at the Father's side, he has made him known. And this is the testimony of John. Okay, so, okay, a lot there, right? Mm -hmm. So. And it was mine because I was I was lost because my the pages were stuck together. Yeah. <laughs> so, so it, right, the first verse, right? In the beginning was the word. The word was with God, and the word was God. This, this is where we get a lot of the language of the Trinity from, because, you know, we are just reading the words given to us here. Mm -hmm. Uh, the word was with God and the word was God. The word became flesh. So Jesus is not produced out of a sexual union between God and Mary. Right? There's a lot of Mormons think that. Oh, okay. Wow. So there was no sex between God and Mary. No. Good. Okay. Okay. Not even. No, not at all. Right. So again, Jesus pre-existing was with God, was God. The word became flesh. And so again, no one has ever seen God. That's the Father. But then, which hang on, which verse? Sorry, verse eighteen. Uh, verse eighteen. 18. Okay, I uh, got nineteen. Yeah. Sorry. No one has ever seen him. No one has ever seen God. The only God who is at the Father's side, He has made Him known. So, there, that is Trinitarian language. Right, that Jesus is both the only God and at the Father's side, with God and was God. But no one has ever seen him. No one has ever seen the that seen the, the the Father, the God. So that would be God the Father, and that will become clarified throughout the rest of the book. So, and this is the testimony of John when the Jews sent priests and Levites from Jerusalem to ask him, "Who are you?" He confessed and did not deny, but confessed. I am not the Christ. Christ is the same word as Messiah. Mm -hmm. And they asked him, What then? Are you Elijah? A reincarnation of a prophet. He said, I am not. Are you the prophet? And he answered, No. So they said to him, Who are you? We need to give an answer to those who sent us. What do you say about yourself? He said, I am the voice of one crying out in the wilderness. Make straight the ways of the Lord, as the prophet Isaiah said. Now they've been sent from the Pharisees. Pharisees are like the Salafis. They asked him, Then why are you baptizing if you are neither the Christ, Messiah, nor Elijah, nor the prophet? John answered, I baptize with water, but among you stands one you do not know. 
even he who comes after me, the strap of whose sandal I am not worthy to untie. These took place while John was in Bethany across the Jordan, where John was baptizing. Um, the next day he saw Jesus coming towards him and said, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. This is he of whom I said, After me comes a man who ranks before me, because he was before me. Now, that's, that's interesting because John the Baptist is older than Jesus. So when he says, He ranks ahead of me because he came before me, he is referring to Jesus's pre-existent nature, right? That Jesus is God coming into the world. Hmm? Yeah, the root, exactly. You're getting it. <laughs> so after this, um, Jesus calls people to be his disciples and disciple means follower is the root of the word discipline. People who look to him to lead them and there's 12 people he specifically selects to be his close associates. Um, and then in in chapter two, he is he goes to he, he lives a normal life. Um but it says on the third day there was a wedding. I don't have the chapter two. Yeah, 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 yeah. I'm summarizing a, a lot of this because it's um this is stuff you should go back and read later. Um but this is kind of the story of how he recruits his disciples. In chapter two, Jesus goes to a wedding. Uh they run out of wine, which is a massively embarrassing thing. And then Jesus and Jesus' mother comes to him and says, Can can you help them? And he says, and he says, It's not my time. And she says, Please. He says, Okay. And so he goes and he says, Okay, pour these pour water into these jars. Then he turns them into wine. Everyone's like, This is the best wine we have ever tasted. So God is a again, Jesus is fun as well, right? That he's at a wedding. He's not this religious ascetic living in the desert who doesn't isn't involved in the world. He actually or he actually makes wine for people and goes to parties. It's fun. Yeah, it brings joy. Yeah. Now, after this, Jesus went to Jerusalem and two verse thirteen says The Passover of the Jews was at hand, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. That's where the temple is. In, oh, okay, it says that. In the temple, he found those who were selling oxen and sheep and pigeons and the money changers sitting there. And making a whip of cords, he drove them all out of the temple with the sheep and oxen. And he poured out the coins of the money changers and overturned their tables. And he told those who sold the pigeons, take these things away. Do not make my father's house a house of trade. His disciples remembered that it was written, zeal for your house will consume me. So the Jews said to him, What sign do you show us for doing these things? Jesus answered them, Destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. The Jews then said, It's taken 46 years to build this temple. Will you raise it up in three days? But he was speaking about the temple of his body. When, therefore, he was raised from the dead, spoilers, his disciples remembered that he said this, and they believed the scripture and the word that Jesus had spoken. So the reason he's doing this is because the, it's putting trade in the center of the temple and it's supposed to be a place for people to pray to God and encounter God and people are turning it into a marketplace and they're distracting from what's supposed to be going there which makes it a barrier to people looking for God. Now when he was in Jerusalem at the Passover feast many believed in his name when they saw the signs that he was doing. But Jesus on his part did not entrust himself to them because he knew all people and needed no one to bear witness about man for he himself knew what was in man. Jesus intrinsically understood, understands people. Now there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. This man came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher come from God, and no one can do these signs that you do, unless God is with him. Jesus answered him, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus said to him, How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? 
Jesus answered, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of flesh is flesh, and that which is born of spirit is spirit. Do not marvel that I said to you that you must be born again. The wind blows where it wishes, and you hear its sound, but you do not know where it comes from or where it goes. So it is with everyone who is born of the spirit. Nicodemus said to him, How can these things be? Jesus answered him, Are you the teacher of Israel, and yet you do not understand these things? Truly, truly, I say to you, we speak what we know and bear witness to what we have seen, but you do not receive our testimony. If I have told you earthly things and you don't believe me, how can you believe if I tell you heavenly things? No one has ascended into heaven except he who descended from heaven, the Son of Man. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. So there's a few things there. There's a story about Moses lifting up a serpent in the wilderness. So it's one of the classic Israelites in the wilderness story. They are complaining about their lives and God sends poisonous vipers to go and bite everyone. And they're like, oh, we're sorry. And then God tells Moses, get a bronze stick and make a bronze serpent and wrap the serpent around the stick. And everyone who looks up at that stick will be healed from the poison. So Jesus is using that analogy to himself. He's like this bronze thing lifted up above everyone that when they look to it, then they'll be healed. Right. And but he's using the term born again. And what it means to be to become God's child is not simply this formula that you say, but the spirit, the Holy Spirit of God awakening things in you that you don't necessarily understand and you don't know where it came from but it's nevertheless at work it's again it's like the wind it's like okay well there's that and 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 so being born again means that is re is referencing something in the old testament that we have hearts that are that are that are rocky that are resistant that are stubborn towards god and what we need is god to remove that heart of stone and give us a flesh, a heart of flesh, which which feels, which cares about His commandments, and and wants to do the things that He He says are good. Mm -hmm. So then Jesus, then it says, "For God so loved the world that He gave His only Son, that whoever believes in Him should not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send His world in, send His Son into the world to condemn the world." but in order that the world might be saved through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe is condemned already, because he has not believed in the name of the only Son of God. And this is the judgment. The light has come into the world, and the people love darkness rather than the light, because their works were evil. For everyone who does wicked things hates the light and does not come to the light, lest his works should be exposed. But whoever does what is true comes to the light, so that it may be clearly seen that his works have been carried out in God. Now, think about growing up with, growing, you know, living your early years around jihadists, right? And the thing you're going to hear about these things is Jesus did not die on the cross. He did not raise from the dead. Paul is not an apostle. What does it say here? People love darkness rather than the light because their works were evil. They have to stay away from this. They have to think that because if they didn't, then they would be exposed. They, they, they're terrified of this. And the atheist? The, the atheist too. There's, there's something immensely inconvenient about all of this to, to all of us to some extent. Um, I guess their sin is that they don't accept Jesus, right? But it doesn't necessarily mean they didn't live um, moral lives. Like, let's say an atheist who doesn't go out their way to hurt people, to screw people over, but neither does he, is he convinced um, that this is the word of God. So a couple things on that. From, from Romans we learn that everyone is, in a sense, suppressing the truth of God. And let's say we're talking about kind of outwardly moral atheist 
here, right? Which I agree those exist, right? I'm not. I this is not saying that atheists can't have civil, friendly lives. First, it doesn't live up to God's standard of good, mm -hmm. right? The law and, and even the best people, they don't live up to their own standards of good either, right? We're all hypocrites who fall short of of the standard. But no one's perfect, except people say Jesus is perfect. Right. Um, but if you, um, why do we believe Jesus is perfect? Well, let's let's keep reading the narrative and see how that feels. Okay, I said we, but. <laughs> um, why should we? <laughs> why should we believe Jesus? Um, so, but also the one final thing on the atheist thing before we kind of get more into the narrative is, um, it is that again if you, we invite you to our, we've invited you to our house right, and if you tried to kind of if you lived in our house but ignored us, never made eye contact with us, never communicated to us right, that's not a viable that's not a viable solution. And so, that's not, that, that's not a sustainable situation. A right? I, you invited me and I accepted. Mm -hmm. I didn't get an invitation from God, but if I did, I, I don't know it. Like, maybe this is my invitation to God. Mm -hmm. um, but maybe I'm like, well, I don't know if I want to go. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know yet. Well, I mean, I, I mean, there it is, right? It's the there's the there's the there's the two roads in front of you. So, okay, yeah, okay, we'll talk about that, and then I'll bring up something that I inherently disbelieve. Okay. And then we'll talk about that. What is it? I want. Well, I don't believe that children commit sins. I think that they're innocent until they are are of an age that really does know right from wrong. At an age of maturity is when and when the brain is developed enough to understand what's right and wrong even with as much discipline as you can give a child a six-year-old is still going to act like a six-year-old and and they can't um and you just have to wait for their mental development to catch on like is it a sin for a child to disobey and not say please and thank you when they're told to and then when they when that clicks in their mind, then it's not that they were sinful, it's just they didn't make that mental mature, that mature level of that connection in their brain. Well, here's a, here's, let's flip the tables on that and make it slightly more terrifying. What if, what if the behavior of a tantrum throwing six year old who doesn't care what happens to the people around them or who they hurt as long as they get their way what if that is just our natural nature and it's all these and society civilizes us right i mean think about it this way children without who don't have fathers or don't have parents you know they don't just stay innocent right that it's it's, yeah, it's, it's, it's they're terrible to grow up. They're, 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 they're forced to grow up but Things like God has given us things like parents and society to to civilize us and, and for, law and law to civilize us, right? And but that those are external things that constrain us. But the Bible says we're sinful from our birth, and that the that those seeds maybe not the full version of what we see later, but those seeds are what in there. Baby's crying. You mean their future sins? The, the nature that's inside them, that... The human nature the human that God created. Well, that, that was created because of the fall, right? God created man upright, then through rebellion, that's why we have this nature in us now. Which is God's predestination since he ordained that. Like, he knew that he's going to make Adam and Eve, and he knows that they're going to fall into temptation... He could have made things differently if he wanted it to run, play out differently. Correct. And and now we're all guilty. A baby, an innocent baby in the world, is guilty because of something Adam and Eve did. 
so t- tackling the so a baby right is not as is is certainly not as guilty as as an adult right so the way i would look at this is romans 1 says that we have that no one has an excuse why because the um you can see god in creation right you can see god by looking at looking at the world around you and you kind of intent innately kind of know it or gods or or like i know children that are being raised by atheists and don't have any concept of god we all know people like that the children are being raised so when they see things that are beautiful and miraculous i think that they're probably thinking wow science is amazing you know this worked out well or sometimes the science is really off and it's not so perfect um compared to seeing it you know that this is what god did like precisely so i think all of us at some point are going to have a moment where the the question comes into our mind and we can either explore that question or kind of push that question down and you know having a lot of people who grew up in china with without being raised as atheists almost everyone i've talked to at some point without having any religious family members has just kind of prayed at some point um but how i look at the babies thing is because of that because of those conditions in romans one like the, the why is everyone guilty because it's evident and that you suppress that that a child who's like just been born is not doesn't have the same access to that stuff as someone who um who who who, who does right so maybe maybe every two-year-old who to every person that dies before they're two maybe they all go to heaven david when his son dies uh and he's mourning for him he says he will not come back to me but i will go to him right david has an expectation of seeing his son again aren't they on like in purgatory or something the, the, or on the or something? there's no such thing as purgatory in the bible oh, okay. so i i cannot look you in the eye and tell you yeah this age is the age people go to heaven this age is the age people will become accountable for their actions yeah. without the influence of like their parents for example isis children mm-hmm. they didn't choose to be born to those parents they didn't choose to be born to terrorists in syria they didn't they are have no part to play except what they've been programmed to know and i see them as innocent because they've been violated and corrupted but not willingly well uh, again maybe you're right maybe there's a certain age where the accountability starts that's not information we, we are given right so for me the what the thing when i think about babies who die when i think about people with like limited mental capacity it, it, maybe the exceptions right then i then my what i the faith i go to at that point is what abraham says will not the judge of the earth do what is right that this is this is this is the kind of thing i'm not given an answer on but we do have an example of god's character so it's easy to let these kind of like technicalities push us away like okay well how are people with situation within a situation like me supposed to hear these things well, not even me like i don't feel like christian children who misbehave slightly just out of the impulsiveness and the the inner apeness or whatever it is that that they they shouldn't i don't feel like they should feel guilty like hold this guilt complex for being maybe playful or not listening or like these things they perceive as sins and and ch- and then they like feel like they have to constantly repent for i am like you shouldn't hate yourself like that yeah but you're not like a sinful horrible human being you didn't commit a crime that you like you, you you were rebelling maybe but it's like 
we can't always be a, like you you don't expect anyone to be a hundred percent obedient or angelic and sinless and so if we're all gonna sin um and even a child why why do we have like that's just how, human nature if that's the case like why feel guilty about it and feel like I've sinned oh no now I must repent forever uh, or you know because that's the nature that God made us in well I mean I mean first of all the idea that God wants us feeling um, living in a state of guilt for our sins is not how God wants us to be that's why he sent Jesus right that because he wants us to feel free from guilt that's the point right not and and so we're not the focus is not on there's a way to approach sin which is digging up your trying to constantly self-examine and dig up yourself but that's really based on your own work to that point is how hard can you repent in order to be right with god rather than well why why can't it be like how hard you're trying to improve yourself in the way for to please god like rather than is, is it the same thing am i making sense yeah, you're, you're making sense but the the, pro, the the main thing we need to repent of right is being is having a self-focused universe right and so if, it, if it's about how hard i can repent or how much i can improve mm -hmm. right you're still focused on you and so the point is the repentance is not is turning away from sin to god receiving whew, relief forgiveness if you believe you're forgiven but in a christian's mindset they always believe they're forgiven mm -hmm. because jesus died for their sin and then like i just don't know where the line where you where you draw the line if someone has sinned against you and you have to say well it doesn't matter because he may have raped my son but he's a christian regardless and he's a faithful man um and so therefore i have to forgive him well th those are those... because i'm also sinful but not guilty well, well that's what we talked about in, in romans right that if one that kind of thing is a probably a demonstration that there's not real repentance there two that it will say you don't avenge yourself but it, that then hope is based in a system that the government should execute that person right so it's it, it's not that you have to like a christian government should ex execute that person a, a just government um whether they whether they're um christians or not i believe rape should be a capital crime if it can be proved but then there's a separation of church and state so the the church cannot say how to how to um do the punishments like how to how to implement the punishments since they're separate the church can speak to the state but it can't control the state right it can give advice it can't say you have to listen to us because we're in charge mm -hmm. there's a difference like it's, it's like me giving you parenting advice i do not have the authority to say you raise your boys like this mm -hmm. uh, i can give advice um and the advice is either right or wrong or neither but it's not the, the church can still speak to the state it can still say hey this is justice this is unjust they just can't they can't just be like right we're taking over Christians grab your guns let's take over and impose you know Christian Sharia right it's that we speak we persuade yes we use argument and and at the end of the day it would be because God says so right I mean like even without God telling me to kill rapists and, or serial rapists and serial murders I'd want that mm -hmm. because it's just for me but it's not the case for everybody no and so if I'm, in a, if I'm in a country that doesn't believe that that's just, then I'm going to say what you're doing is, is fundamentally unjust. But the main thing I'm going to be talking about as, as someone who's part of the church is, hey, 
the reason you do not have a good grasp on justice is because you don't know the author of justice. Look at the consequences of the world from not knowing this. Yeah, that's very conceited. Right, and my job is not to make anyone see it. My job is to speak the truth, and at the right time and the right way, God reveals himself. And so with the sin thing, right, um, I'm not worried about, you know, if, if you're feeling... If you're feeling guilty for sin, right, come to Jesus. There's, and, and if and if I'm not feeling guilty for sin, but like for me, I feel like this is just a, my journey, and this is the natural process. Not that I'm like I'm not intentionally sinning. It's just me being authentic and sincere. But according to Christ, maybe I am sinning because I haven't like embraced him yet I, I i i don't think i would put it that way mm -hmm. right I, I i do not think that you're in active rebellion right now you were consuming books of the bible like i can't think of a good example of things things people eat quickly but you, you, you just you're just eating this all up right i i want to okay so the reason this topic came up is that I was talking to a friend who was saying they feel they they forgave their mother for the abuse that she did because uh, to her because mm -hmm. she, that's what Jesus would do. Jesus will forgive her mother because her mother's a believer, so she's going to forgive it, and then everyone should just forgive each other if they're Christians. And I'm just I'm like well, that's like giving people like just. Jesus may forgive somebody, but why do we have to be like like that? Like, do we necessarily have to forgive just because Jesus does? Okay, so there's a few there's a few things to this. The, the first is that a lot of Christians, I would argue, have a very have a slightly out of sync view on this. Right, that what the Bible says is if your brother repents, forgive him. Doesn't say just forgive everybody now it does say never avenge yourselves right but there's a difference between not avenging yourself and forgiveness right or protecting yourself right and, and, he, and even if you forgive somebody right even if somebody's hurt you tremendously and you forgive them you say hey you let it go doesn't mean you have to trust them it doesn't mean that trust is rebuilt but it just means that if they if they repent you you let that go right and it's for you as much as it is for them, right? Mm -hmm. Unforgiveness and bitterness. Yeah, it's poison. It's, po like, yeah. it's poison. I, but I but know that saying like it's like drinking poison and expecting the other person to be damaged from it, like holding a grudge that way or yeah. being angry. But it's not like, but it's not enabling. It's not seeing somebody doing something repeatedly and being like, "Well, I forgive you because Jesus forgives you." No, the Christian response to that is like, "Hey." you are not acting like you are supposed to act and I'm concerned for you and this is going in a bad direction and you need to repent, mm -hmm. right? And if they're like, oh my gosh, I'm sorry, then it's like, hey. And you don't think that they would say, well, Jesus forgives me because I've repented to him. I don't have to repent to you. Or I don't, uh, like when people can justify, well, they, they'll let things go and their sins because they know that Jesus already died for their sins yeah well I think the if, if people are having that kind of attitude mm -hmm. then I think it's a it's a shallow and possibly fake repentance right that okay. that, that real repentance doesn't let you do that yeah it's remorse yeah it is you have to you have to, you you have to address the people you've hurt you can't just okay well I'm forgiven so I don't need to deal with this mm -hmm. No, it's no, not like no. going and hiding you're forgiven for your sins now and doesn't it doesn't it so you still have to like make things better right if you really are feeling remorse you should you should do what you can right you should you should do whatever you can to kind of as paul said as far as it depends on you be at peace with all people that means if you hurt people and you can you know and you can say things that will resolve that um then you should, right? Even if you believe you've received forgiveness from God. You know, it's not like in Islam, in some streams of Islam, where if people receive 
withhold forgiveness from you, God can withhold it. It's not that, but it's that if you if you've really repented and you're really listening to Jesus, Jesus says, well, if 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 you if you have sinned against your brother before you make your gift of the offering to God, go and make things right with your brother. That's what Jesus commands us to do. Right. So, okay, I've confessed my sins to Jesus. Okay, why aren't you listening to him? Why are you not resolving things, right? And it's not to say every single conflict gets resolved cleanly. Mm -hmm. Sometimes, you know, we, we have the wrong ideas about things forever, but the principles are clear. Okay. What, where are we reading chapter... Are we? Because I'm still on John. Yeah. And then I I know that you you made a reference to chapter two.